Just, just very quickly, the introduction again. So Philip is pretty much an indie developer legend here in Austria, and yeah. I'm super excited that, that we have him here as a speaker today. And also with sound this time, extra clap Hopefully. for Philip with sound. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, thanks for being here. Um, would you thanks mind introducing yourself a little bit yourself now with sound? <laughs> sure. Uh, I hope everybody can still hear me. I'll try to speak very loudly. Um, I'm Philip. I'm actually from Graz. I studied information design at FH Joanneum until about 15 years ago, so very long time ago. Uh, and since then, I've been mostly working in games. So after college, I, I was self-employed for a while and had a small startup uh, back in the heyday of Flash games. Uh, we, we produced advertisement games and small games that we put on our own website and all the various portals around 2008. Uh, then we moved into iOS games, um, but ultimately uh, decided to close down the company in 2012. Uh, 2012 to 2015, I worked on my own indie game. Uh, I have a background in design, but I had done a lot of programming work in the past years and uh, created uh, an entire indie game by myself. It took me about two years. Um, did the graphics, music, code, writing, game design, everything on that. Uh, 2015, I started working at Social Spiel. That was a studio in Vienna focusing on mobile games. Around 20, 22 employees, I think. That lasted until around 2017. I worked there as a programmer, game designer. And for a year, I also did uh, writing. I uh, wrote uh, a script, like 140. Can you still? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I, I wrote, I think, about 140 pages of, of dialogue in that, in that wow. year. Wow, wow. Um, so I've, I've done many things. I'm an expert at nothing, but um, I've, I've built up experience in, in, in a lot of different areas. So I wouldn't be able to apply as an artist uh, at any decent games company, but I can make my own game, games assets, stuff like that. Uh, cool. In 2017, after uh, Social Spiel went insolvent, I started a company with three of my former bosses, uh, Iron Mountain Interactive. Um, we had uh, around three million US dollars funding from a Chinese publisher and worked on a, um, a mix of mobile and sports game for PC and console. Uh, we, we took that into early access last year in August. Uh, unfortunately, our funding was not um, extended and uh, Iron Mountain closed in mid-December. And now, uh, since I'm pushing 40 and there's no better age than that to go back into the indie space, I'm planning to uh, to spend the next one year or two to either work on another game by myself or in a very, very small team. So I'm going back to back to indie. Wow, that's, that's it's really, really, that's a story. Like you, You've learned pretty much every every part of the game development, and you've gone through all the different um, phases and seen all sorts of the business. So, what was your? Well, I mean, this this might be a, a tricky question, but what do you think was your most interesting part of your journey, or your favorite part? Favorite part is easy. That was Ace Ferrara, uh, the, the mobile game I made back in to late 2014, early 2015. Okay. Um, I'm, I didn't go into games because I, because I was particularly into gaming. I went into games because I, I had studied uh, media design and uh, had been learning programming on the side for years. And I, I wanted to find something where I could you know, bring together different creative disciplines and find the intersection with high-end uh, programming work. And that, that was pretty much what pushed me into the gaming sphere in the first place. So the two years where I could really, you know, focus on modeling 3D assets one day and creating sound effects on the next day and then writing AI on the next day, that, that was easily the, the best time I had in my life. Yeah, cool, cool. I mean, I mean, this um, indie game development experience, um, you mentioned you it took you two years. Did you only work on that game? Um, how was your, like, I, I find it so inspiring that you, you worked so, f it, it seems like you worked in a really focused way um, on that game. And then really from that year to the, to the publishing, 
um, phase. Um, so, so how was your experience on that? Um, how, how did this phase of your life, um, life look like? Yeah. So the first half year, I worked part time at a very small in Vienna. Um, at first, it was four days a week, then it was two days a week, and then after about half a year, I would focus entirely on my game. Uh, what I did at the same time, though, is um, I, I gave lectures at, at some mm -hmm. colleges in, in Austria. And I think I, that was the time I also taught game design at Technical University in Vienna, or at least one of the years that I did. Uh, so it wasn't focused all the way, but I think it was 80% of my time was easily going into into the game. Mm -hmm. And. Um, it, it takes a lot, I think, um, to really finish something. Do you have any like tips or concepts which worked for you um, to really get from that year to the finished product? I would really uh, hammer. I would really like to hammer home the point that uh, you should start small. You should start with a with a small project. You should make. Uh, this before you should make uh, Space Invaders before, or whatever, before you should make Super Mario Brothers before you make that MMORPG that you've been dreaming about for the past two years. Um, I had a background of having already been self-employed for around seven or eight years. Mm. Uh, with my small startup, we did a lot of work for advertisement agencies and then also big, um, big media companies, like we licensed the Flash games that we made to Disney or Viacom. Uh, which meant that we had, you know, finished uh, around 30, 40 projects easily uh, in a very small team where there was no way to get external help. Um, so we had, we had already, I had already learned to be very self-reliant and smart about planning and, and know my limits and know um, uh, what I can do and what I can't. And still, I got it pretty much wrong. I thought I would spend one year on my game and it took me, well, one and a half if you if you condense down the time, two if you count the time I spent uh, working part time uh, as well. So the first and probably most important tip is uh, start something that you know you can at least scope down mm -hmm. to uh, to account for all the surprises that you encounter along the way. Oh, that's so that's true, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. I mean, what about time management? What about procrastination? I mean, those are always things which are sort, especially if you're working all by yourself on a project and there's Twitter and there's Facebook and there's TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so how did you face face this issue of potential procrastination when working alone all, all by yourself on such a project? That would have been the, the second suggestion after, you know, scoping it down. Uh, start um, recording your hours very early. Start doing that while you're still at university. Um, the idea is that if you if you track uh, the hours that you work and go down to a granularity of, I don't know, uh, coding uh, this bigger task or that bigger task, or in my uh, case, I. I had different, you know, sub projects and tasks like graphics or sound design or, or stuff like that. Um, if you if you record the hours you spend on tasks and projects and make a habit out of it, mm. uh, on the one hand, you'll get a much you'll get much better over time at estimating uh, the time you're going to spend on a project uh, and estimating all the things you don't think about uh, mm -hmm. when you when you start the project and make a big project plan. Um, and on the other hand, and I think this uh, this ties into what uh, what you were saying. Uh, it also shows you just how much uh, time every day you spend procrastinating, <laughs> spend on Facebook or spend on Twitter. So if you if you there's there's websites out there for this where you can just you know start a a, a timer and say now I'm working on this, and once you're done you you click uh, you click stop. So mm -hmm. there's very little friction, very little overhead to to this. It costs you nothing. It's a good habit to get into because. Uh, if you have then spent 10 hours uh, that day sitting at your desk and working on your thing and you uh, you look at the hours you've actually worked and it's six or seven, that's kind of a wake up call. It, it sort of uh, um, teaches you to to spend your time a little more mm. focused, I think. Oh, 
this this is wonderful this is also something which i, I find it's important too so i use an app which is called toggle um do you have any specific app which you can recommend or what do you use for tracking or uh, not currently like the last project that i did on my own was five years ago back then i used a service that was called my app, which I have no idea where they are right now and if they're still up mm -hmm. and if they have, still have free plans. No, um, the past couple of years I've been starting to do pre-production for side projects again. And I've just been keeping a Google Sheet, mostly okay. because at this point in whatever I'm starting, I'm more interested in what does it cost me to, to produce this asset or that asset or how much time can I, well, when mm -hmm. I was still working with Iron Mountain, I was more interested in just how much time can I can I sketch out on average every Saturday afternoon. So I like the idea of having this this granularity uh, that you get from you know really writing comments in a spreadsheet and and uh, and then um, being able to not use a third party software to to sift through their database, but just having all the data yourself and being able to. Uh, to make conclusions quickly by you know, typing a few mm -hmm. useful sums into into Google Sheets. So right now I'm still with with Google uh, Docs and uh, I'm planning to move away from there. And I'm looking forward to your suggestions because I think you've spent some time uh, uh, getting to know the different platforms, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So if I would have tracked all the time, where I tried to find tools to not procrastinate or so. <laughs> It would be a lot of time, yeah. But but I um I, I used for a long, really long time. I used Toggle. Toggle really works mm -hmm. nicely, and you can have it in the app and everything. But somehow, to be very honest, I I don't know. I sort of always come back to a traditional paperback journal. I hate to say this, <laughs> but mm -hmm. um for 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 task management and also for time management. Yeah, this is not the most fancy way, um, but but actually, it's, it helps me writing down things sometimes. But again, Toggle Toggle worked nicely for me when I'm really working on specific project projects. You mentioned one word which I find very very important and interesting, and this is where I already want to go to next, which was habit, mm -hmm. building habits, and and do you. Do you want to share a little bit of, of your habits? Do you have any specific habits, like like a daily routine or something like that? Mm. I really like taking my laptop to bars in the evening and uh, getting it. <laughs> that's, that's a habit. I'm not sure if that's what you were asking for. That's uh, <laughs> that around the time I was self-employed, like uh, sitting alone at home all day. Uh, Staring at the staring at the walls uh, and, and, and being by myself, um, I noticed that I would start to get unproductive. And and since then, I've sort of made a habit out of you know uh, working in cafes or bars every every once in a while. And I really like uh, the idea of splitting work into chunks that you can make meaningful progress on mm -hmm. in an hour or two. So that's uh, that's very it's a very hipster-like habit to have, I suppose, but uh, that's, that's, that's cool. something that actually helps me be productive because I can squeeze in uh, or squeeze out two more hours uh, my working day. Yeah. Um, other than that, I've never thought about my habits. Um, I do make plans a lot, but that's not anything special. Like, I, I, I like um, when I start the day and I know I have a lot of complex tasks going on, I like to really write down uh, little items and assign time slots to them mm -hmm. just to make it a, a bit of a game to see how far off I am with my estimates. So it doesn't happen that often, but it happens frequently enough that I start the day by writing down, okay, uh, 10 to 10.30, work on this, mm -hmm. 10.30 to 11, work on that. And uh, like plan ahead five or six hours and then make a little game out of, can I can I actually match that, uh, that plan? And I barely ever can. But, um, still makes it more fun and puts a little bit of pressure on me. Oh, that's good, yeah. yeah. Um, and that habits. I did make it, that's not really that special either, I, I suppose, but I, I I, do make a thing. If, if I'm eating alone, I usually watch 
either game development or game design or art talks or stuff like oh, that. Oh, that's cool, yeah. I do that a lot, yeah. Okay, so what sources would you, would you recommend for that? Like, where do you... Uh, GDC Ward. GDC uh, Ward, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not super big on, on YouTube and YouTubers in general. Um, <laughs> I can probably not... Like, I don't have a favorite stream or anything like that, or a YouTube personality. And as soon as it gets into someone trying to be a YouTube personality, that, that is kind of off-putting to me, personally and frankly. Uh, but um, I think I've recently watched a lot of Game Maker's Toolkit, which is good, I think. Um, something else on the tip of my tongue in a second. I can't put my thing on it. No, uh, the only thing I remember is that why do you really good coders, uh, particularly graphics coders, where I, I found uh, videos where they describe their workflows where you can watch them work and uh, and I just have the stuff on while I'm when I'm eating. I can't remember the, the names mm -hmm. of them. Look that, that up later if you're interested. Cool, cool. Would love to. You can, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Speaking of this idea of going out and, and being productive there, I mean, I, I totally understand that. Like, I also love working in a coffee shop or something like that. It's, it's a really interesting atmosphere, which does not work right now um, because of, yeah. the, of the corona situation. Um, so how did, how did things change for you? Does it have any impact on you, on your life, and also on your way of working? Mm -hmm. We had a we had a weird head start into the whole lockdown thing. Just around the first day of, of lockdown, we, we actually moved flats. Uh, so we, um, we had a bunch of things to do around the flat. And I, I have a, a, a nice uh, office space in there, which is good because I'm planning to work mostly by myself for the next year or two anyway. So I've been getting into that. It, it has been feeling weird and not having that social um, valve or outlet. Uh, I miss that a lot, but I noticed that for the for the past weeks, like last week, we, we crunched a 70 hour week to get done with a grant application. Uh, for the past two weeks or so, things have been feeling surprisingly normal, surprisingly normal because we were just working all day anyway and took a walk like once or twice a day and that's it. But yeah, I miss being able to go out more than anything. Uh, I don't miss going shopping or anything. Um, do, you, do you have any general advice as a, um, for indie developers? I mean, since especially working at home, especially working all by themselves, um, do you have any yeah, general advice or anything you want to get out there? You mean like uh, outside of the whole corona? Yeah. Thing, you I think my most general advice is stuff that I've already given. We would need mm. to get more specific those. If I can think of something, I'll get back to it. Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. Um, so it's it's very interesting, like with the different paths and routes you've um, taken. Sorry, I just thought that the kid uh, <laughs> awoke. Um, <laughs> So one very interesting path is obviously also founding a company um, with um, Iron Mountain Interactive. Do you, uh, how was this journey for you? Um, are there any specific takeaways from there? And also, I mean, this must be a huge difference, like working all by yourself in your specific um, style on, on, on your project, and then all of a sudden working on such a huge project with an entire team as one of the co-founders. So what was like this journey for you? What were your takeaways? How, how did the processes change for you? Yeah. Between my own project and Iron Mountain, there was Social Spiel, which was to a large degree the same team. I think we employed at, we had like 16 or 17 employees. Half of them had already been at Social Spiel. So it was sort of similar size, sort of similar team. The only thing that was different was that I was one of four co-founders. Um, I was not 
that involved with the organizational stuff. My official title was creative director, though I spent easily 50% of my time coding. <laughs> um, but we had a dedicated business developer and CEO who is really good at that sort of thing and who, who comes from a startup world and, uh, and is really into that, uh, into that part of the, of the business. I have a, I have a friend in, in, in Silicon Valley uh, who, who calls the, the kind of startup that I had founded back in 2008 where we were mostly interesting in, interested in being able to uh, to keep working creatively, he used to call that uh, a lifestyle business. Mm -hmm. I think that might be a common term. Uh, and I think the difference for someone like our CEO was that he comes at it more with the goal of, uh, you know, building a business, maybe with an exit strategy, finding investment, all that, all that stuff. It was fascinating for me to um, to be able to learn a bit of the ropes there, uh, but it's not. And I, I mean, I, I took part in all the high level decisions, but it's not like, like I was the one actually negotiating, being in the room and negotiating the contracts. Mm. And um, I have to say, it's not the way I would uh, approach a company uh, of my own in the sense that uh, I would not want to be a full time entrepreneur, I would want to be a, a, a creative person, a game developer, first mm. and foremost, and, um, and uh, uh, work business as, uh, as part of the whole team, not, uh, not as a goal uh, in itself. The goal is creating good games. Um, still, it was, uh, it was interesting to, uh, to, to transition from uh, sort of being the same level as all the employees being treated uh, mm -hmm. differently. It felt like the, there was a power differential that I was hating in the sense that I you couldn't have these um, these friendly jabs at other uh, co-workers uh, mm -hmm. anymore, like you would if you were all on the same level. It felt like uh, oh, okay, I see I you. To watch my, I had, I had to watch what I would be joking about way more carefully, and I'm, I'm, I am a, a careful person about that. <laughs> don't don't get me wrong. <laughs> it, it was just a surprise to me how how much of a difference there was in knowing all kinds of stuff that you could not talk about or speculate with your fellow co-workers about. Yeah. You see what I, what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, being, interesting. Having, yeah, being able to, to be in a position where you learn a little bit more about what's going on behind, uh, behind some of the curtains in the company and not being able to talk about that with, with co-workers. There was a, a transition that that I felt uh, much more than I had anticipated. Not that it was bad, just uh, it was a surprise. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't thought of it that way because obviously you probably know a lot of those people already before um, working with them and, and things seem to change. Um, coming from this uh, routine that you worked all by yourself, um, and how how was working um, with a big team? Um, how were the processes? Um, any takeaways or recommendations from there? So I think you mentioned that you um, used uh, use Scrum as a team. Yeah, we did. It was a modified version of mm -hmm. Scrum. Uh, I just noticed Felix is asking what topics were those. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry. Please, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, like uh, everybody has their own um, opinion on the product that the company is making and uh, its prospects and everybody has their own uh, idea of, how do I put that? Um, if you're working on a, on a on a project with a, with a bigger team and you're an employee there, uh, you might speculate with your co as to, uh, well, have we heard anything back from the publisher on this or that yet? Or uh, what's the, what might the, uh, the atmosphere be like with the publisher at that point? And uh, how much money do we have left anyway? Um, and we've been pretty transparent about most of those things, but still you mm -hmm. can't engage in any sort of speculation and you can't really 
you're not really invited uh, to uh, uh, to the the part uh, to the water cooler area where that's uh, that sort of stuff is discussed anymore. Mm -hmm. it just feels like this this invisible barrier, and here it's mostly about finances, potential shops, or the potential future of the company or the product, stuff like that. Sorry, um, your question. No, 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 no. I, I just saw um, I missed a few a question in the chat. Let's quickly go there. Um, ha ha ha. Sorry, if chat for missing your questions. So there was one question: What are three games you despise the most? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I cannot yeah. remember the context here, but <laughs> yeah, archiving this for posterity. I'm not sure if it's uh, more in the street. <laughs> um, no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, and do you believe in the Balmer Peak? I don't actually know what that is. What is it? Um, the, the, the Balmer Peak, let me quickly uh, get the... Um, I think this is where you have a specific, very, very specific amount of beer. Um, in your body, like I think it's two and a half oh, beer or yeah. something like that. Right. Um, I, I'm just googling the exact number, <laughs> yeah. but um, the, but it is actually supposed to be a perfect co uh, quota right after 2.3 <laughs> beer or something like that. Sorry, I don't have the um, yeah, correct yeah. number with yeah. me. <laughs> I remember I heard it before. Uh, I believe that people are different and uh, react to uh, be it differently uh, and should drink responsibly. I don't think there's uh, like, I don't think you can sustain that for a whole day. Um, but I think it might get you over the <laughs> point where you're not interested in, in working anymore. It's a dangerous habit though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just need to release my cat. So give me one second and I'm sure. going to put on the light. Okay. Good. The assistant cats are gone. <laughs> okay, um, again, chat, if we missed any questions, please just add them again. Oh, yeah, a question. Can you move your mic closer? <laughs> For me, I can move the laptop closer. <laughs> All right, it sounds, sound, sounds great. Sounds, sounds great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're not like I am not having the most professional setup. I'm sorry for that. But quarantine lectures are a little bit different. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, cool. And and Joey a little bit lower. Ay ay ay. Yes, there we go. So I hope it's better now. Hi, Sir Dialot. Okay, good. So um, I think we stopped at uh, pr project management um, in, a, oh, yeah. in, in a in a size. What size was Iron Mountain Interactive? Um, 16, 17 people. Okay. Do you have any project management project management tips for for this sort of site? Because it's an interesting, mm -hmm. very interesting size, obviously. So, yeah. um, do you have any tips for project management um, in that size sort of size? Mm -hmm. So we did, we did Scrum in the in the loosest sense. I suppose we didn't follow it religiously. We, we had, um, I think there's different philosophies about how to run a project and a, and a games company. And particularly at that size, it also depends a lot on who's on your team. So mm -hmm. um, I've worked with people who had been working with other uh, Austrian game companies and uh, some of them have a much more you know militaristic idea of uh, which is not a bad thing of, of hierarchies and, and processes with us it was quite organic we had um, we had the the doctrine that feedback can come from anybody uh, mm -hmm. on the team and feedback is not the same as a direction so a direction comes from the art director or the creative director or the lead artist or mm -hmm. whoever is, or the game director, whoever is uh, risk the owner of a particular um, uh, feature or aspect of the production. But feedback can come from anybody, from uh, the person who was just hired for QA and then uh, sat in on every character uh, design meeting and, uh, and gave their input, which was much appreciated, uh, just as much as 
as a director can say, well, this is feedback, not a direction, do with that what you like. I think this, for the most part, worked for us quite well because there was quite a lot of trust uh, within the company and people quickly learned, I think with 16 people you can do that, quickly learned uh, you know, not to overdo it, not to sit in, a, in an already long character concept or world building concept or whatever meeting and drag it out by saying everything that was... Uh, that was going on uh, mm. in, their, in their heads at the time. Um, I think it made the product better. And with our team, well, we were making a multiplayer game, three versus three players. Uh, so a lot of the time was spent on testing. Mm. And with a six player game, you need six people out of the team. So everybody was testing once a day. And that uh, that really made people not afraid to uh, to comment on, on all the recent changes because they had everybody had spent a lot of time with everybody else on the team because everybody was sitting in a playtest with each other. So there was enough trust that you could, you know, say if something, at least I, I hope and believe that's the case, say if something felt really, you know, off or wrong or right about the last changes we had made to the product. Mm -hmm. So that, there wasn't a lot of documentation. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, of you know, structured process other than doing, you know, monthly sprint planning and uh, and daily stand-up meetings. And our producer had time to, since we weren't a big team, uh, had time to to sit with everybody uh, once every few days and just, you know, have an informal short talk about their progress. Uh, and that worked well for us, I would say. Mm -hmm. There is a question, I think a follow-up question on that. What do you feel is often overlooked in managing a small team by Pixel Prophecy? Hmm. I can't think of anything interesting beyond stuff that you've probably already heard. You can't throw more people at a problem to... Uh, to reduce its time in the sense that you can't, can't have, uh, you can't, you can't have a six month feature, uh, be condensed to one month by throwing six. That was, uh, that's, that's, that's one thing, but something you should, something you've probably learned if you've, if, if you've produced games for, uh, for a year. Um, mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can't. I can't really think of anything else. I think. I think honestly, and that's not my responsibility. Um, I think we did a lot of things really right and well. I think the total planning could have been better, and the, the scoping of the project. But in terms of managing the team, I think we did well. The only thing that we that I'm going to say that's negative in that regard is we did accrue quite a lot of technical debt, and I think it might be an easy trap to fall into when you manage a team that that you have that you don't trust people enough when they tell you that the code base is rock uh, and that you can we can put off you know polishing that up and refactoring stuff for another three months but not another year that's mm -hmm. probably an easy trap to fall into which mm -hmm. i think to agree with it yeah mm -hmm. other than that Okay, um, so so I would love to switch the topic a little bit. Um, so in general, I, I always um, like I, I love reading, and um, I, I know and I see in the background. I think also that that um, you you reader. Do you have any any recommendations for us? I mean, you already mentioned that you're not only a reader but you're also a writer. Mm -hmm. You you wrote all this dialogue. Do you have any? Any recommendations for interesting books for us, or, or also another question, maybe more general? Where did would you take your inspiration from? <laughs> Two very oh, <wow>. different questions, <laughs> not not small ones, but. <laughs> let's let's start let's start with the one I. I actually have good suggestions for uh, off the top of my head uh, writing, um, so I spent 2016 and early 2017, like one year on a project with Social Spiel where, uh, where they needed a writer. And I, I filled that role, actually coached two juniors to, 
help me with that as well, but I, I produced around 140 pages of dialogue and I would not call myself a writer just as much as I would not call myself an artist, I dabble. Um, but when I do uh, dabble, I, I try to, to read up on the subject. Um, and for me, this is certainly not going to work for everybody. For me, um, learning a lot about story structure helped really a great deal. Like uh, you're probably familiar with Joseph Campbell's um, work, like the, um, the Monomyth. Uh, there's a there's a there's a, a version written by I think his name is Fogler. Um, actually, it's probably in that. Um, that's written more for uh, for screenplay writing. My apologies. So. Uh, Getting that one is probably a little bit closer to, to what you can use. Uh, I myself uh, am really into, into a version of the hero's journey that was developed by Ben Harmon, the, the guy who wrote Community and then uh, Rick and Morty, which mm -hmm. probably even more of you are going to be familiar with. He condensed the whole thing down into a series of MySpace blog posts back in the uh, mid aughts And I've really been following that a lot. He gives a tool with which he structures not only his stories, but he might structure a scene around that, uh, um, around that, uh, calls it a story circle. Uh, and yeah, so so it's just a, I'm, I'm not going to go into it that much because not everybody is going to. Be. But yeah, um, on writing, I read quite a lot of books. Uh, screenplay by Sid Field is another classic that's, mm -hmm. that's really good. Um, the Art of Dramatic, something, something by Lajos Egri, a, a book that's focused more on, on drama and theater. The Art of Dramatic, I don't know. If you Google The Art of Dramatic, you'll find that as well. That's <laughs> a, a great one too. Mm -hmm. So that's books for writing. Um, books on game design, I, I would say that I've read most of the, of the books that are, you know, part of the Game Design 101 curriculum. I'm not doing as much on game design as I should. Um, I, I really like that whole theory of fun thing. Mm. That's Costa, isn't he? Is it Costa, Costa, Ralph Costa, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a big fan of the Book of Lenses, but I think it's a, it's a useful, mm -hmm. it's something you should have read, even though I, you know, even though I didn't enjoy it immensely or, or, or take a lot. Uh, other than that, I think I think I think for myself, when I when I started uh, working in games, there was not quite as much game game design literature as there is now, mm -hmm. and I haven't caught up to everything that hasn't that has come out in the past ten years. But since I've, I, I think I've switched more to a to a talk format because I I know the credentials of everybody I'm watching and I can focus on mm. games that I've actually played. Um, yeah, I think I do read two or three books on game design a year, but I would be hard pressed to come up with recommendations. Is there a, is there a post mortem talk from Ace Ferrara? No, I don't think so. There was a talk on visual. I don't think there was ever a post mortem. Should be. Yeah. <laughs> you have an audience. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, and there was um, like a Twitter thing recently where everyone was asked to post for the four most important games, which were, I, I don't know the exact phrasing on, on Twitter, but it was like, which were most important um, for for you and also for your career development. Do you have any games in your mind uh, which were inspiring, mm -hmm. uh, important? Yeah. Uh, one of them for me was was certainly uh, Zelda, The Wind. Um, I was really into that. I know there was, when it came out, there was a huge controversy and that it was, uh, you know, geared, toward, geared towards children. I think nowadays we wouldn't think that about a cartoony game. Uh, for me, it was the first video game where I really thought um, this works for me as an adult. And I, this wasn't a time where I was playing 
that many AAA titles, but it felt mm. to me like it was ahead of the of the rest of the um, of what the industry was doing in in how mature its tone was at times. Mm -hmm. And then as an interesting counter example, when uh, Shadow of the Colossus came out mm. and everybody was raving about how how games had matured, I have to say. I didn't like it that much, and I got into a lot of arguments. <laughs> I really respect who really loved it. Uh, for me, it always felt like, yeah, okay, it has a more serious tone, but uh, if, if like, um, if like I went ahead and wrote that same thing as a as a short story or as a poem, people would probably think I'm very young. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a different, you know are for what's considered uh, adult themes or, or serious writing in video games and deep experiences and, and uh, you know, uh, serious topics, all that, all that stuff uh, in video games on the one hand and still exists to, to this day. Games have been growing up a lot, but there are quite a few. That's why I did not want to answer the, the games I despise a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. There are quite a few games that I think have been lauded for for how how much the, they push the medium forward, and I I played them and thought, yeah, but what if this was just a book? Would anybody be paying attention? Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Other important games. One game that I think stands out in that regard and has helped with uh, making indie games uh, uh, feel explode into, you know, more mature um, content was a uh, Sword and Sorcery, which originally came out for for iPad and had this whole, it was a pixel graphics game, very atmospheric, uh, mm -hmm. and it had this whole uh, hard to understand story about uh, Jungianism and, and I don't know, it's been a while, but it, it had a good, good vibe that you, like a, a strange, very singular and odd, uh, vibe to it that you that you didn't know from that I did not know from other games and I think it it was just vague enough that that I thought it was really deep <laughs> um, what's mature about swords and sorcery huh. <laughs> I thought it was ambitious in how it talked to the player and how it again they they were probably just being vague enough to pull that off for me Oh, I'm, I'm commenting on something that someone asked in the in the chat, by the way, if you mm -hmm. missed that. What's mature about Sword and Sorcery? Uh, maybe we should argue about that uh, uh, in, a, in a private channel or some other time. I I think it's something that that stood out with me because it it it, it felt interestingly meta on the one hand uh, and. It did not, it neither, um, it was neither overly angsty and, uh, and edgy or anything, uh, nor, you know, super sunny and arcadey. Uh, it, mm -hmm. For me, it was the, it had a really good, um, you know, rainy day atmosphere mixed with a, with a sort of ambitious way of, uh, of talking to or at the player, which again, probably just vague enough that I thought, okay, this, this sounds deep. Uh, yeah, uh, but for me, sword, sword and sorcery was was something that stood out and that I thought helped. If it did not help the medium move forward, it certainly helped my idea of what the medium could be move forward. Cool. Third game. Why are you asking for three games? We can we can change the topic. I, How many you want yeah. to? Um, um, I think I have in... nothing on my mind right now. You can, you can ask another question, or we. Can... <laughs> You know, so um, maybe the, the question which we a little, missed a little bit was about the inspiration sources for you. So oh, yeah. um, I don't know if you have any techniques, how to get new ideas or to get inspired. Or, um, mm. There are, I think, the different ways. And I would love to hear a little bit of where you get uh, mm. your inspiration, especially since you're working on all different topics. like on art, on um, design, on audio. Oh, on audio? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. On writing? Sometimes. On audio and, and the programming. So you, you probably need even inspiration for different fields. So what are your sources? Yeah. 
Well, art uh, interest mainly. I have a um, I have a folder with with inspiration for all sorts of topics, and I I collect ahead. I'm not uh, focusing on anything on anything in in particular. Uh, for characters, I've recently looked a lot at high fashion uh, 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 pictures because there's just weird designs there that you can copy a lot from. Uh, for character concepts. Uh, Wrestling has been an interesting source of inspiration. <laughs> I, did. Cartoony, tropey, larger than I didn't America. see that coming. <laughs> That's pretty <Yeah>. new. <laughs> 80s wrestling, 90s wrestling, you can you can watch those YouTube videos and they are so good at, at creating cheesy archetypes. That that doesn't work for, for every <laughs> game, of course, but if you're already working on something that's a little cheesy. This makes uh, so much sense, good. yeah. <laughs> uh, on the on the complete other end of the spectrum, uh, the, the concept, the game concept that I thought I would be doing all through last year um, was very, you know, pretentious uh, and maybe a little bit sword and sorcery like in the in the sense that it was pretty pretentious. I actually read all of uh, James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake mm. to uh, get a better um, to to just uh, um, how do I put that? I, I had a big uh, uh, for those who don't know it, it's supposed to be a completely incomprehensible book, and it is. Uh, Joyce wrote Ulysses, Finnegan's Wake, uh, Dubliners, and other um, uh, famous novels, uh, early part of, of last century. Um, Finnegan's uh, Wake is mostly gibberish and inner monologue. And for me, it was it still felt like um, I, I was thinking about making a game where there would be no, no singular protagonist and uh, the whole world would be emotional all the time and all that pretentious indie stuff. Uh, and it felt like this would be something that was close. And the way he would treat language might be something that I could draw from. Uh, and, and I actually sat there with a, with a big notepad and took down notes all the time. And that was, uh, that was interesting. So I'm not afraid of, you know, going deep, but for the most part, I don't have to. There's Pinterest and there's wrestling and <laughs> Interesting, resting. I, I will quote you uh, on that. <laughs> the, the magic of game design, Pinterest, and wrestling. <laughs> for for Ace Ferrara, Ace mm -hmm. Ferrara was my my project from 2012 to late 2014, right? And uh, the idea was to to mix uh, the space combat combat simulation for mobile mm -hmm. with uh, 80s cartoons. So I watched a lot of. Uh, you know, Mask and, and Thundercats and Captain Future and all that stuff on the one hand, which some of your audience might not be familiar with anymore. These <laughs> cartoons. A lot of that is getting remade now. So, um, and on the other hand, just classic cheesy uh, sci-fi series like UFO uh, by I think Gary Anderson, uh, Thunderbirds Are Go, which is also a kids' show, but it's puppet uh, puppet uh, uh, puppeteered. Um, and then Lost in Space, uh, I don't know what all they are called. So, so if, I, if I try to hone in on a, on a is that the right word? If I, if I focus on a specific uh, game, I usually, you know, adapt what materials I'm looking for cool. for the game and, uh, and what media I'm looking for. So I think that's probably what you can draw from all this. It's wrestling, it's James Choice, it's uh, children's cartoons and it's whatever. Thanks. Cool. Cool. Thanks so much for sharing that. That's that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so since we're already talking about inspirations, um, is there anything you you want to talk about your um, your new projects after um, Iron Mountain Interactive? What is your new path? What is your anything you want mm -hmm. to share with us? It's too early for that. Not because I'm trying to keep it as it's still, it's still to be determined if I can get any sort of you know, finance. Um, if I, if I have to, uh, to whether I can. Uh, it's still to be t determined if I need to get uh, external funding, can get external funding, or if I have to dig into my and or if I have to dig into my own uh, savings. Um, so it. It's also still to be determined whether I can spend a year or two or mm -hmm. three on that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and whether I have to do it alone or with other people. So there's different concepts floating around. Mm -hmm. There's one that uh, that I quite like, but that's too early to talk about, and the others, to be fair, are still very vague. I've been experimenting a lot with uh, different rendering styles. Uh, I've been prototyping different game mechanics, mm -hmm. um, and I've been creating assets and you know tracking my time just to, <laughs> to get an idea of what mm -hmm. can I even do in six months or eight months or 12 months or 16 months. Uh, and I'm fine with not casting anything in stone just yet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've, I've made a big um, slide deck with uh, analysis uh, of uh, what am I good at, what am I bad at, what am I experienced, what am I with, what is easy to do, what is hard and elaborate to do, like writing a lot of story, it takes a lot of time, I mm -hmm. think it's not there, but there. Um, and I've, I've tried to, you know, close in on different kinds of projects from that side, like what can I do in... 12 months, what can I do in 20 months? Uh, what can I actually try and make the place to my strengths rather than, yeah. This is super interesting. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit more about that? Like, um, so all your skills and, and so what is in this in this table or in this list? This sounds super yeah. exciting. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, for instance, I would say that I'm quite experienced with AI, at least mm -hmm. in an in Britain. Uh, for for our um, our multiplayer MOBA uh, game Steel Circus, I've written AI for Ace Ferrara, and it was decent enough. Uh, like Space Combat AI, Team Sports AI, I've written AI for a ton of you know smaller flash games. If it's not triple A, I can do it well, I mm -hmm. think, and I can do it fast. Um, I'm good at graphics programming. Uh, I, I'm good at generally finding intersections between art and, and technology. Uh, mm -hmm. I can I can do things that are coming from an artist's uh, perspective, even though I'm not, I could probably not get a job as an artist. I'm good enough that that um, makes me a better rendering engineer. I think mm -hmm. I'm visual effects and stuff like that. That also gives me a leg up with procedural design, pr procedural content, uh, specifically procedural game assets, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's a strength of mine. Um, I'm really weak at producing a lot of 3D character assets. Mm -hmm. um, I am really strong at uh, at doing things like uh, getting variations in of different character assets, doing animation retouching, uh, a whole bunch of uh, of different characters who are all animated similarly but a little bit differently and have some procedural elements in the animation. And so I could probably populate uh, a small uh, indie game village with mm -hmm. characters if I can get a de decent enough base model and come up with an algorithm or just a look and, and feel uh, an art style that uh, where it doesn't you know matter so much that I suck at modeling and I'm really slow at it. Uh, so I'm trying to look at it from that way. I'm not, I'm not as a game designer, I'm not really that or that experience with systems design, mm -hmm. like all the meta game stuff with the with the games that we did as Iron Mountain or or Social Spiel. Uh, Helmut, our game director, was mostly responsible for that, and he's really good at it. Uh, I think I'm not entirely horrible, but it's not my area of expertise. On the other hand, game feel, uh, probably combat mechanics, not really deep combat design, but you know, on the surface, I'm probably really quite good at that. Uh, particularly since I can, you know, come at this sort of thing from both a programmer and a game designer uh, mm -hmm. direction. Hmm. It's, it's well, I can go on, but yeah. yeah. The, 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 this is like, I really love this, this concept this, that you spent really, a, apparently a, a really bunch, like a good amount of time into thinking about that. Um, and it, I, I actually, I think, this is super useful. Like um, I haven't, I've never done that. I've never thought about what am I good at, what are my strengths or my weaknesses, and built actually a, a plan around that. I, I feel this is this is really good. It's really helpful. And did did you find things you want to learn based on that on that table or on that um, map? Yeah, I, I think I need to get better at three D level design puzzle design.
that's I'm keeping it vague because it within that very broad scope it can become pretty much anything at this point. Someone says my audio is gone. Can you still hear me? It's back. Ah, I'm back. Okay. okay. Um, I lost my train of thought. Well, am I learning something? Yeah. Uh, so again, I suck at producing 3DS, and I've never, I've never personally done, you know, really 3D level design. Mm -hmm. Even a lot of blockouts or something beyond a game jam or two, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's something I really want to get into. I've never modded uh, games, mm -hmm. and that's not the way I'm going to look at it. But that's that's accounting for how inexperienced I am at that part. I I, I need to brush up on that. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, at the, at the start of our talk uh, or uh, session, you asked for general advice. Mm -hmm. Now I might have some. Um... <laughs> 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 no, no, that's that's. Uh... I'm making all these uh, these analysis and plans uh, because. Uh... No, I'm 40 now. I'm going to spend a year or two depleting my savings account work. You know, guaranteed to get you any sort of revenue uh, and, and, uh, and get you your investment back. So I'm doing this for myself. The, the last time I did this was 2012 to 14. So I was 32, 34, I'm 40 now. I'm not going to do this again when I'm 50 and have to think about my pension fund. Um, so I really need to go at this sort of thing uh, with a lot of respect and awe. Mm -hmm. And I think even, I, I, I think the best way to motivate yourself, um, if you work on an indie game that is not, you know, funded by someone else, is to think of what a huge privilege it is that you can afford to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be in a position a lot of times anymore to be able to afford to do this. Yeah. So. I'm paying for the privilege, and that's, I think, even if you're very young, even if you're just out of university or college, there are all these opportunity costs associated with, you know, trying to make a game. You could spend those six months earning money. Mm. Uh, I think thinking about how it's not very often that you get the chance to do something like uh, and thinking about that it's not the brightest idea in the world, if you want to see to to start an indie game in 2020, uh, at least if you're not already established. Mm. Uh, I, th I think coming at it from this uh, direction can give you a lot of to not uh, sit down and uh, and call it a day early. Um, That's just this keep is, working on it. This is pretty. I this is really really good advice. Those are really wise words. Thank you for that. <laughs> Cheers. Um, Maybe like one thing which did, we did not cover yet, if you still have a little bit of time for us. Sure. Um, so, so this is one of the last things I actually have with my list of need to know things. <laughs> what what tools um, do you usually work with? Um, mm -hmm. Like can be everything, can be apps you're using, can be... Um, can be the game engine you're using, can be the tools which you use for creating your game design, um, for for writing, or whatever you want to share with us. Yeah. You said writing last, I'm going to start with... Like in the Ace Ferrara days, I actually used screenwriting. These days, I just use Google Docs. Uh, mm -hmm. Same for any kind of project management software. I don't use anything... Uh, specific, more specific than that, at least not currently. Game engine, well, Unity, mm -hmm. uh, 3D modeling, Blender, um, mm -hmm. and I'm really happy with uh, the recent progress that Blender has made. Super <laughs> awesome. Uh, I've dabbled in Substance Painter, um, mm -hmm. which I don't feel like I really need anymore. Blender has improved so much, even though it's not, you know, on par. There's uh, with as far as the feature set is concerned, uh, Lender has other things going for it, like you don't have to push the assets through some kind of pipeline to get from one software to the next. I love Substance Designer. I started working with that uh, last year, so that's procedural texture generation, which is um, right up my alley. <laughs> um, well, 
other than that, the usual stuff, Photoshop, Illustrator, After Effects for animating trailers and stuff like that. Uh, for audio, it's uh, mostly Reason and uh, Ableton Live. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's that's the list. Oh, that's, that's a good list. That's a really, really cool, mm -hmm. cool list. Um, any anything else um, you want to share with us? Any? I mean, this, this was so many. I think really, really a lot of um, cool elements and so many tips um, which can we can really learn of. And mm -hmm. um, I was really inspired um, um, from um, from your project projects. Um, any are there still any questions from the chat? Um, then feel free to place them now. And I, I would. Um, like from my point of view, my like pressing last question would be if you would start over again and would you do anything in a different way? Or what advice would you give your past mm -hmm. young Philip self? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that's a good one, I think. Start networking uh, early and do way more of it than really. Uh, when we started working, when I started as a self-employed uh, person around 2005 or something like that, and we founded uh, 2008, uh, flash games were, you know, all the rage and uh, be able to put out a flash game and you would be able to, to get two million people to play that thing on your own website, which are huge numbers, and uh, you would have all these portals that would email you and ask about a license and <laughs> We were thinking like, okay, that's good. That's a good gravy train. Uh, not that we made a lot of money, but uh, we did not have to do what we were bad at, which is business development, which is putting yourself out there, which is going to conferences, which is contacting mm. people uh, or building up skills in any of these areas. Uh, and I think it, it would have opened doors for us then that could have turned us into, you know, a bigger, better company. Um, mm. And... These days, you certainly can't do without any of that. So I um, am not a particularly extroverted uh, person, uh, on the contrary, but I try to, to make it a thing, uh, even still, to uh, to go to Game Dev Cuts and to go to uh, uh, Game Dev Meetups in Vienna and to go to other you know, industry, uh, um, uh, industry happenings, gatherings, uh, and just try to be there and talk to people. Uh, I would really, really, really advise uh, each and everybody, particularly if they're still students, to do the same. Just mm -hmm. start getting out there, uh, no excuses, just make a habit out of going to uh, to the things. Yeah, that's that's very good. Like you, the conferences, the meetups, um, what else can you think of? Exhibiting their own games if they have, right? Yeah, right, right. You could, you could, uh, um, yeah, game jams. Uh, oh, game jams, yes. Game jams that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That far ahead. Uh, but yeah, um, just having a social media presence, having a, a Twitter and uh, and whatnot. I'm not particularly good at that either, uh, but uh, back in the Ace Ferrara days, I spent really a lot of time uh, and, and working on social media and making social media a habit. Um, but yeah, game jams, of course, take part in game jams. But still, really, get out there uh, uh, in your in your town, uh, in your city, uh, in your country as well, and uh, start going to the things. Uh, I <laughs> the other people. <laughs> I just shared like in that in that sense. Oh, yeah, I just sense. shared your Twitter. I, I think I haven't tweeted anything. Uh, anything. <laughs> Hey, since since April April 17 was the last one, oh, no, yeah. no pressure. But um, we're very interested to see your following updates yeah, yeah. on Twitter on the following project. You already got us excited, but it's it's super nice to hear that you are working on something. And I think um, we are all very excited to see what what it's gonna be. And so yeah, am I. <laughs> Yeah, no cat content on your on your Twitter profile. You have to work oh, with that. You have to scroll down. You have to scroll down. <laughs> this year. Okay, Philip, okay. thank you so much for for this really helpful um, discussion. I think we got a lot of 
I really a lot of, out of out of um, the way you're working, the way you were able to to make such wonderful contributions to the game development world. So thanks so much. Um, I think in that sense, can I ask the chat for a big round of, of virtual applause <laughs> for Philip? <laughs> well, and, that's a thing. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, we try to make it a thing at least. If there cannot be real applause, we at least need to some virtual thank you oh. and clapping for you. Thank you so Thanks much. A lot. Thanks for having me. That was uh, fun. Lots of fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Enjoy the, the rest of your week and yeah, hope to see you soon uh, um, post-mortem talk. Yeah. <laughs> this would be fun. <laughs> okay. Extreme Bye. clapping Bye. noises from the from the chat. <laughs> okay. Cool. Good night. Bye. Ciao. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining today's lecture again. Um, um, Philip is a very, very, very inspiring speaker and developer. Um, as you just heard, so please follow him and his projects also on Twitter. And yeah, this is also from my side. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining the lecture and, and this nice discussion. I really then started to enjoy um, this sort of, of um, lecturing. Um, and thank you so much for all this interaction in the chat because this makes it so nice. So thanks so much. Good night, everyone, and see you next week. Bye-bye.